This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 31. My guest is Willie Loya, also known as Will Loya, and uh, he's a very talented musician and a very um, talented visual artist. And we're going to talk about all that. Um, he was in a very popular band in the 80s called Califas, and uh, he's also toured with the group War, a legendary band. He's also played with Lalo Guerrero, with Mark Guerrero, and the Second Generation Band. And um, he's worked with the Teatro Campesino and toured with uh, Danny Valdez. And he's got quite a resume. We're going to talk about all that stuff. So welcome, Willie. How are you doing? Hey, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And I can see some of your great artwork behind you. Uh, you're a fantastic artist. And I might mention you just uh, did the artwork for my new EP, Southwest Serenade, A Journey Through Aslan, and you did a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so we're going to show that later. Um, so uh, you're an artist and a musician, and I believe that you started out more with emphasis on art, like through school and everything. Yeah, when I was a kid, I, I, I kind of leaned towards visual art, partly because I hated math. And also because I got a lot of I got a lot of encouragement from my teachers, and you know, right about at the end of elementary school, I started identifying as as an artist and headed down that path. And you showed talents through school too, and you even went to college for art, right? Yeah, I got a, a BFA in drawing and painting from Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, uh, you know, Cal State Long Beach was a big uh, ground for me. It, I had I became politicized. I I became uh, started identifying as Chicano, and I started you know when I started the different music groups. I marched with Cesar Chavez. This is all back in probably late seventies. And I also because I was in the art department, I did I did some exhibits. Uh, I was curator for some shows and trying to you know just studying art, developing, trying to develop my own style. It's amazing because, you know, I've known you since I think we we're trying to figure that out, maybe the late 80s. And I didn't know till like two years ago you were an artist. You know, and I was absolutely blown away by it, you know. Um, so how did the music seep in and where did it start to come into the fore? Well, I always loved music. Um, I, I really uh, when I was in junior high school, I was part of I was in the Glee Club, which was a, a class. Um, it was an actual class period. And I was a, a great uh, mentor, teacher of mine, a guy named David LeBeau. He was the choir director. And so I learned I learned to sing harmonies, to develop my singing voice. I also did, a, we did a lot of performing as a, as a, as a, um, as a glee club uh, competitions and stuff. That was my first experience, you know, performing in front of an audience. In fact, it took me a long time to ever match that feeling that I had as a kid singing in a choir, wow. you know, in front of an audience, that feeling of just being exalted and just really enjoying the moment of a, as a performer. That was, that was, I think I kind of got hooked by that early and it took me a long time to top those early feelings. And what school was that? That was Eastmont Junior, Eastmont Junior High School, which is there in East LA. Yeah, it's right there on the other side of Atlantic, right? Right. Is, that, is that considered uh, Montebello already, or is it still East LA? It's a Montebello. Yeah, so it was Montebello Unified School District. Right. But I always tell the uh, the viewers that uh, Montebello is part of East LA. You know, th that whole section in there, there's a city of commerce, and there's all the, you know, that's all East LA. You know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's but, kind of east of East LA. Yeah, yeah. A block or two, you were about a block or two east of East LA. But uh, yeah, so did you go to, uh, what high school did you go to? I went to Bell Gardens. That's where things changed a little bit for me because um, most of the kids that went to Eastmont went to Montebello or Sure High School. Uh, but all the kids that were in Commerce went to Bell Gardens, which was a whole nother environment at that time. Bell Gardens was like mostly white kids, um, a lot of Dust Bowl um, families that had come there. Yeah. Uh, migrants and stuff and... So a lot of my first friends there were all kind of poor white kids. I made a bunch of really good friends. Also, a lot of Native Americans in that area. I had some neighbors uh, where I lived on McDonald Avenue in East L.A. that were those kind of Dust Bowl, white, poor people. 
uh, oak people from Oklahoma, Okies, right. and, and uh, Cudahy had a lot of them too. That whole area down there. Right. What's now, weird is is that I don't know how it happened. I was talking to somebody the other day about it, but my teenage band, Mark and the Escorts, when I was like fourteen or fifteen, we played at Bell Gardens High School for an assembly for the student body. And I was just saying, how did that happen? A, it wasn't like a Chicano school. B, at, at that time, there weren't a lot of rock bands playing for assemblies at schools yet, you know, especially right. in 64. You know, but we played down there. It went over well. The, the girls were screaming. The Beatles had already come out, and they were, like, screaming for us and everything. Um, well, there was, there was that famous musician that came from Bell Gardens. Um, his name was, well, the, of course, the, uh, the uh, Alvin brothers of, uh, Dave and Phil, who were friends of mine. The Blasters. Um, the Blasters, they were from Downey. Mm. But there was another guy who did, uh, oh, I can't give his name, damn it. Uh, but he was from Bell Gardens. Um, okay, it'll come to me. Mm. So what was what's next for you? So now you got your music is happening, your art's happening, and what was your first band you were in? The first band that I was really in was... You know, when I moved, when I went to Cal State Long Beach, like I said, a lot of things changed for me. Uh, my my brother Mark had moved to Hawaii, so I was I had kind of become more um, politicized. Started identifying as Chicano. I was part of the Rasa Student Coalition. I was doing illustrations for their radical paper. Uh, you know, along with my art studies. Um, then I, we started. We marched with Cesar Chavez. And that's, in a lot of ways, my life really changed then. I started identifying more with not just protest music, but just music of that era. And, you know, even Marvin Gaye and a lot of that stuff was very influential. Um, when my brother returned from Hawaii, that would have been 75. And I was I had already started um, studying Latin percussion with a guy named Chewy Perez. Mm -hmm otherwise known as the Mongolian horse. I don't know if you guys ever met him. He was, yeah. a real, he was a real character. And he taught me a bunch of wrong stuff on the congas. And I had to like relearn it from Cubans like years later where they were correcting me that he'd stuck, he had Chicanoized. He, he mm -hmm. had this Chicano style of playing. But uh, I did play with him. We did some concerts. And then we decided to put Khalifas together with Kwee and a guy named Gilbert Chavez. And then eventually Rick Reyes came into it. And then that was like the late 70s. And Khalifa's really started officially in the 80s, like in 1980. I must say, since you brought up your brother, uh, Mark, uh, he, he also, I don't know if it was from then, but he later became known as Marcos Loya. Yeah, I think a lot of us, we he kind of was a good example of that. A lot of people, you know, kind of Chicanoized their names. Right. And, like the, the great artist Carlos Almaraz. Well, we knew him, my brother and I, he was Charles, you know. Till the movement, they became Carlos, and yeah, we went. We all went through that. Yeah. I kind of caught the tail end of it in a way, uh, but yeah, we all went through that, and it was a great. It was it was a really great time. Yes. So we didn't discuss how did you wind up on percussion of all instruments. Uh, there was a guy. Well, my sister's my sister's husband. My sister Mona's husband was the Talamantes, and there was a guy, and his name was. Um, Ray Talamantes. He was a percussionist and he played in all the local bands. He was a lot older than me, but um, he, I I was turned on to the free, free percussion lessons at, Cal, at uh, East LA College hmm. and Chewy was the instructor. And so him and I became close friends. Um, I started, I painted my first mural in his, in his workshop. It was called Tapa Workshops. He was on Sunset Boulevard and he was a character. And so we, I took lessons from him and I painted a mural for him and we became friends. And that kind of just developed into me studying a lot of percussion. I had already played a little bit of drums and, and guitar, like a lot of people, but um, I started studying seriously, congas, timbales, bongo mostly. Nice. And because I had a singing background with my you know, school and stuff, I was able to bring that, that be able to sing background and didn't really get into singing lead until later on. So your brother Marcos is, uh, you know, a very talented guitar player, and he went on to do quite a few things on his own and and teach at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills, right? Right. And uh, so he was the leader of Califas. Right. He was the leader of Califas. We were all we kind of were, uh, we worked together to, you know, I, I did a lot of the PR and, and uh, 
that was sort of my role. I helped us get a lot of, you know, concerts, events, uh, different things that I was, I, I kind of wore the PR hat for a while there. I was pretty good at it. I liked it. But, you know, it, sometimes it takes away from your playing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's nice to have a manager when you, I figure that you're a real band when you have a manager. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so Marcos is super talented. At that time, we were flying pretty high by the by the mid eighties. We were we were doing a lot of really big shows. We were kind of hot stuff. We started to play some original music. Um, that all went right. Like I would say that eighty five, eighty six was the was the you know the top of the arc for the band. We had, we did a bunch of great shows. We did we didn't do as much recording as we should have. In 83, we did a recording called Los Angelinos with Ruben Guevara. It was on, uh, it was on Zanya Records. It's, it was a compilation with The Brat and Los Illegals was on there. And Los Perros was on there. I recorded the drums on their track. So it was kind of a, it was a nice moment in East LA. Things were happening. Uh, you know, even though you know, so many, and you're a big part of the whole East LA scene, it kept... It stayed, it stayed, but a lot of it kind of went through all these different, you know, changes. If you wanted to include the punk rock stuff and and all, all of that scene, it was evolving during that time. And Zianya yeah. Records was a subsidiary of uh, Rhino Records. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah, during that time, I was playing a lot of gigs in Orange County, and I kind of missed some of that '80s stuff in East LA. And I, I had heard of you guys, but I, I never actually saw you guys play anywhere because I. It's kind of out of the loop at that time, as far as being on the scene. We yeah. did a we did a million weddings, <laughs> those types of events, but we were also known as a really um, popular, like solidarity type of band. Activist, of activist stuff. We did a bunch of fundraisers for local local Chicano groups, uh, Lulac, and all of that stuff. We did a million of those concerts, uh, banquets, and fundraisers. We also did a lot of things with Cesar Chavez. I had a chance to meet him personally, and I had I had a chance to take some photos with him. And back, you know, we were asked when he when he was doing his fast up in Delano. We with Martin Sheen was there, and and Cesar was there. He was fasting, and we were asked. Khalifas was asked to go up there and play. That was a big honor for us. Was and, that his his big fast, or is one of his other smaller? The big one, remember it? Uh, I think it was a Bobby. kind of. You know, I know he did a bunch, but I think he was one of the bigger ones because it's just the way that they, the way that they um, set it up, and the whole performers and all the performers that were there. We also played at his funeral. Yes, well, wow. yeah, the big was, fast was when Bobby Kennedy showed up, and he like didn't eat for like a month or something. It was geez. no, that was before. But yeah, when when I was there, it was uh, Martin Sheen was was kind of the big celebrity person at that time. Great man. Loved him. I got to meet him a couple of times too. And great man. Um, so uh, you know, we already mentioned all the members of Califas. Uh, we talked about Quiqui, right? Right. Quiqui, Irma, La Quiqui, Rangel. She's a, a local star. She's been had a lot of her own projects. She's also been an educator. Um, you know, she does she's worked in she's worked with seniors. She's still she's still performing around town. Um, she was also doing the karaoke thing that was really fun. I, I joined in that a few times, but she's, she's still going strong. She's a great friend of mine. She had at least one solo album and I saw her perform with a really great band once. Uh, and I have one of her uh, CDs. Nice. Yeah, she, she's done a lot. So when we were discussing, she plays a hell of a blues harp now. Yeah. Can't do that. Can't do that. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to talk about Khalifas before we move on? Um, well, you know, it, what happened with Khalifa's is a lot of it was just, um, you know, I think what this happens with a lot of groups where there's like a star in the band and they kind of move away from the group. That's kind of what happened with us with my brother. And so we, we after that, after the, the Khalifa basically lasted for, through the 80s and in the early 90s him and I were still playing together and he had kind of moved away from the band. Part of it was him and Queek, we were a couple, they broke up, but that was also a part of the, the, the reason the band dissolved. You know, that happens a lot. There were all, we're all still friends now, but um, then we kind of went on and we picked up, we started picking up 
we were his, my brother Marcos and myself were part of a band that we, we used Joe Rotundi, different bass players. Uh, we started backing people up um, in like big award shows. We did the, uh, the uh, Alama Awards. We did a few of those award shows and we found ourselves backing up different people. And so that became kind of our forte for a minute there. And that kind of would led to us being on the Paul Rodriguez show. And Joe Rattani is a fantastic keyboard player. Yeah, he's Joe's a good friend of ours. He's rock solid. I think he's one of the best players in, in L.A. And then we that kind of led us into the Paul Rodriguez show. We did that for about two and a half years. And that was great. You know, for me, that was in many ways the highlight of my musical career. I had a chance to play Spain with Chick Corea. I had a chance to play Love the One You're With with Stephen Stills. We performed uh, numerous times with Tito Puente. Celia Cruz was on the show, uh, you know, doing their classic songs. So we, it was, you know, the basic format was like talk shows. So we had the, you had the host and you had the couch and then you had the house band that was us. And they were, they put a lot of production value into that. Your brother was, uh, your brother, um, Danny was the uh, one of the producers. We had a great time on that show. I thought it was going to last forever, but you know there was budget problems because it was an expensive show that in, in Univision was not used to spending that kind of money. So they kind of pared it down, and then eventually, I think it, I think they finished the did the last taping in ninety three, something like that. But like my dad was like a co-host at, near the end. He was sort of like the Ed McMahon. Yeah. The Ed McMahon with talent. He's yeah. The co-host and he'd get up and sing There's No Tortillas or sing one of his great songs. And and he was funny. Yeah. And by that time, I was good friends with Lalo and, and we had played together. We had started playing together. Uh, and he did. He even came on the show when we were the house band and we performed with him. That happened a couple of two or three times. We did some of his classic numbers. He was always good. He was always funny and just a joy to be around. Tell the story about uh, how you met him and you gave him a ride from wherever. Yeah, we were doing, it was in Sacramento and I'm guessing it was about early Khalifas because we were, at that time we were doing a lot of solidarity gigs and we were doing a, some type of a fundraiser up in Sacramento. Quickly had grown up in Sacramento and gone to DQU, which was a, a like an alternative university there. And she had a whole uh, group of friends, musicians, poets, artists. Uh, there was a guy named Louis the Foot, you know, Louis the Foot. No. Okay, <laughs> but the yeah. most famous Louis the, the, Foot. the most the most famous one was Jose Montoya. And mm -hmm. he was part of that same circle. And so I met him there. We did some performing with him. And Lalo was on the on the bill. Um, Lalo was on the bill for a concert that we were doing up there and he needed to ride back to LA and I had just met him at that show I think and then so he drove back to LA with us in our band van and he entertained us all the way home and of course we became, we became good friends I want to mention that Jose Montoya is a, a famous uh, poet right yeah Jose Montoya is a famous uh, famous poet and a musician you know he had a band he had a band called uh, Casindio they did a couple of albums, uh, really cool, quirky music. Um, he's also the father, of course, of Richard Montoya, who's in Culture Clash. Right. And uh, I just had an opportunity to do an art piece for Richard, uh, curated a show in Fresno featuring all of the different aspects of Jose Montoya's work, his poetry, his art, uh, his music. It was a great show in Fresno, and, I was, and Richard commissioned me to do a piece of Jose's early home in in um central valley anyway so yeah so that was cool and you know that was part of the whole sacramento scene there was a definite chicano scene up there that we were a little bit a part of and you know that's when i met your dad and i also met other other chicanos i met al reyes who was a journalist and also a performer um that was so that was probably early 80s you know, Khalifas went on and, and played. I, I know we shared the stage with, with Lalo a few times after that. Yeah, during the 80s, you know, there were a lot, we were lucky to play with a lot of great players. And one, one of the players that I forgot to mention was a guy named Joe Baragan. I always thought his name was Joe Berrigan. He told me he was Irish. 
but he li he was our next door neighbor. So the, the Baragan family was our neighbor in the city of commerce. And I can recall he was kind of an early influence on me. I remember being, I don't know, six or seven and going next door and sitting on his porch and listening to him rehearse his band. And they were doing all the early cha-cha stuff and kind of some of the crossover cha-cha rock and roll stuff. He had two or three albums, um, you know, where they had that cool photo on the front where Joe's dancing. And then he's got this beautiful woman dancing in you know, the tight dress and, you know, the bright colors. There was so many albums like that, but he was a great, great player. He played a uh, tenor alto, great uh, flautist in that style of Jose Fajardo with the really tasty Latin flute player. He was, he was with Khalifa's all the way through, um, you know, and, and even after we did some gigs, because he was always just rock solid player. You were mentioning how you met my dad. I was trying to recall how we met, and I don't remember when or how we met. Yeah, I was trying to think of that the other day too, and I I know that you and I took a trip when. So I had I had met the I had met the people in the Theatro Campesino, and I started doing shows, some of their productions, and I had made friends with all of them, the Valdezes, and you know Luis and Danny and his family. They also had a sister who was an actress, and they were just totally just a very deep and talented uh, Chicano family up there. And I guess, yeah, so then you and I, somewhere along the must have met through your dad. I can't, I wish I could remember the exact day. I remember. And I don't yeah, even so remember we, how you wound up asking me or how I wound up going with you up to uh, San Juan Bautista. I remember, you, I remember you saying you wanted to meet Luis Valdez. And I said, well, I know him. Let's, you know, we just kind of just said, let's do it. We went up there and we hung out and, stayed with David and Cynthia at their old house. We had a really good time. It was fun hanging out there that, that weekend with you. I'm thinking that must have been yeah. late, late 89, 89, maybe 89, maybe, I think. Yeah. And then we, we visited the teatro and everything. But unfortunately, I think Luis was not in town, so we didn't meet him. Yeah. Yeah, so I've seen him, you know, a bunch of times. Just recently, I was up doing, doing a gig with Daniel at, at the teatro. This was two weeks ago. And we did some of his original music. And he also has like, there's like a whole Valdez dynasty of musicians up there. Daniel has a son and his son has a son. And they all have bands, really talented people, really talented people. I'm trying to get them to bring that show to come down to LA or who knows where. We're playing Palm Springs. Well, we definitely got to know each other driving all the way up there, all the way back and spending those days up there. And we had a good time, you know? Yeah, we had some good laughs. But that's how we got to know each other. And uh, then we started playing together after that. And yeah, so we that's when, we, I guess, when the, the second generation band and the, the gigs that we started doing with Lalo, we decided that was like, started like in the maybe like... Oh, that was, that was like 99, really. So it was like 10 years later. But there was some stuff that happened before that. And one of them was the McCallum Theater in Palm Desert, near Palm Springs. All right. Lalo and Amigos show. Yeah, and here I got the t-shirt. Yeah, there you go. Well, <laughs> I, just, I designed that t-shirt for, for your dad. And Luis, when Luis Valdez said that, saw he said, hey, you, you, he lost some weight. <laughs> I said, yeah, I can make people taller, too. And that was kind of a bad joke to Luis because he's small. Yeah, when, when Ignacio Gomez uh, did the sculpture, of a statue of my dad that now sits right out here a few miles from my house in Cathedral City. Uh, there's a statue of my dad. And when he first did the first model, he made him a little too thin. And I said, add some more clay. Add some more. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but anyway, so my brother put together and produced this incredible show at the McCallum in 1992. And it was to raise money for College of the Desert and music students. It was uh, for a worthy cause. And oh my God, I, I think it, I don't think there's ever been a bigger and better collection of Chicano talent ever than on that day. You know, if you remember, uh, God, who, I mean, who was there? Uh, Don Tosti, uh, Danny Valdez, Paul Rodriguez, Cheech Marin, Eddie Olmos, uh, and Cesar Chavez was there. Uh, little Joe, little Joe, right, little Joe. Uh, you know, it was just an incredible, you know, uh, congregation of talent, and it was put together like it could have probably been broadcast on national TV. The yeah. set was incredible, and uh, I got to sing a song that I wrote for my dad 
for the event called the Ballad of Lalo Guerrero, which right. kind of told the story of his life in a three minute song and, and his music. I named a lot of his song titles, a lot of his characters. I did that solo. And then I did a, a favorite song of his that uh, called Do You Believe in Reincarnation? It's like a 50s doo-wop style song. And you and your brother, Marcos Loya, and this wonderful band backed me on it. I played piano. And I remember. You can find it on YouTube. It's just uh, Mark Guerrero, uh, Do You Believe in Reincarnation, McCallum Theater. It'll, it'll pop up. And it, it was a great band. And we had female background singers. Do, 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 wah, 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 wah. And right. You know, percussion. And it was a really great moment. Um, so, yeah. What are your memories of that uh, day? Well, I remember that it was a big, it was a big deal. I remember that I was, you know, we were, I felt really honored to be there with the talent. Um, you know, we were, it was, it was a challenging show because we were backing up a lot of people. So we did a lot of different styles. Uh, that was something that was also kind of a, something that was a, a strong point of my brother's music and his direction was being able to handle different styles from ranchera to jazz to um, Afro-Cuban um, so that was that. Well, those shows were really fun, and I remember we did it the next year as well. It was more a comedy kind of a yeah. comedy based show, and we backed up Paul. That was part of us getting doing the Paul Rodriguez show was was backing him up on some things and kind of being his his opening act. We did so the idea of the show was all these artists uh, performed a Lalo song, you know, like uh, Cheech Marin did No Chicanos on TV, yeah, but. Um, Everybody did a Lalo song, and my dad was just witnessing it. He was sitting up in the box, like the right. queen, like the Queen of England in the box there, right. or like Abe Lincoln. I remember. I remember <laughs> that. But uh, yeah, he got to witness all this, and it was a, a wonderful day. And then afterwards, we all went to a Mexican restaurant together, and everybody was partying in various ways. Yeah, it's quite a quite those, an were good, those were good times. I remember that, Mark. Yeah. So, how did you wind up uh, playing with War? How did that happen? Um, so, so this is like in the, I guess around 96, I believe. So I was good friends with, um, I had, I've been doing the Paul Rodriguez show, so I had some exposure and people got to see my playing and whatnot. And so I was friends with Sal Rodriguez. Sal Rodriguez is a great drummer singer. And at the time he was the percussionist for war. And, um, so he got, he got a gig with Tom Jones <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a super touring gig that paid a lot of money. So he called me and asked me if I wanted to do the the war gig. And I told him, yeah. So I, I it was the uh, first gig I did with them was the last gig that had all the living members in the band. So Lee Oscar, Howard on guitar, um, of course, Lonnie on keyboard. Um, there was another guy who had done some playing with him. The original drummer, percussionist for war, I guess he died at a gig. Papa, Papa D, something like that. Anyway, so I came in as a singing percussionist and, you know, I, I was comfortable with my singing and my harmony. So I, I kind of fell into their three-part harmony uh, for all those great songs, you know, that War did. And I, I did I did that gig for about three years. They, they didn't play a lot, but I'm guessing I probably did maybe 25 shows with them over a three-year period. We played all over the, you know, we played all over the, the country. We didn't go out of the country, but it got to the point where I remember I really got my taste of being on the road, you know, and doing that thing and not knowing what city I was in when I was in the airport. <laughs> if I was in, it's just Detroit. So, but it was fun. Lonnie's a genius. I, I loved playing with him, listening to him playing. He's just, and then all those great songs. It was just, it was, it was pretty magical most of the time. All the gigs with war were super fun. Sometimes the traveling and everything dissolved when you when they got on the stage and you started the show. All the weird stuff. <laughs> there was a lot of weird stuff. All the weird stuff just faded into the background. Yeah, that was, that was a great that was a great period there. And then right after that, I started doing um, I I started doing USO tours. So they asked me to do a shows in, in Japan and in Korea and mostly in the Balkans. So, you know, um, we started playing, doing USO tours for US bases and NATO bases all throughout the Balkans. There's a bunch of bases there, also in Germany. 
uh, Sarajevo, uh, Croatia. So we would be on a tour bus. So this was a few years after the the Bosnian War. So it was kind of, you know, there was all, we always had um, security when we were on the tour bus. I went there like four times. I went there one time with Kwikwi, actually. I, I was the road ma tour manager for Kwikwi and Joe Rotundi, Eddie Resto was in the band, Mike, uh, Mike Archuleta and myself, I was playing drums and we did a bunch of touring through that. And that was like a Cinco de Mayo tour with, it was the Quigley band. That was crazy fun. That was crazy fun. And then I, a couple other times I went mostly as a tour manager. Uh, I toured, I, I wound up playing with all the groups that I was the tour manager for, just because there was a drum set and, so I just started playing, um, but we had some fun times. And then 9-11 happened. And so they came, they wanted me to go to the Middle East. And I, I was, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go there after, after all that. Don't blame you. Yeah. So another memory that came to mind was uh, in 2005, the group Yaki, who uh, made an album in 1972, and uh, Yaki, Tierra, and myself, we all had the same manager at the time, Art Brambilla. Uh -huh. we, we all wound up with major labels. Anyway, um, in 2005, there was a reunion show at the Hop in Pointy Hills. And uh, because uh, uh, Art Brambilla, their manager, was re-releasing their album in CD form, you know, limited basis, but at least to get it back out there in the world. Right. And... Um, they asked me to uh, play with a band because uh, their other lead, their second lead singer, Eddie Serrano, had passed away, and uh, a few years before, so they wanted me to come in and do his parts, his vocal parts, and uh, so uh, I wound up playing a lot of the Yaki songs with them, doing Eddie's parts, but they also backed me on my stuff. I'm Brown, you know, uh, in, on the Boulevard, and a couple of my dad, well, at least one of my dad's songs, probably Chuka Suaves. It was a really great show, big crowd. And I asked you to, to play uh, Latin percussion with us. And uh, well, actually, you were playing congas. And on Timbales, right. we had the legendary Rudy Regalado. Right. The, the late Rudy Lake Regalado. That's right. That's right. Who had played with El Chicano and Yaki. So it was a great was, show. Do you have any memories of that one? I do. It was super fun. I remember it was, it was I'd seen Rudy play you know, all over town, but I had never really played with him until that night. So that was great. The songs were fun. I remember that was the band was really well received by the audience. It was really fun. That was a great night. And uh, the Yaki drummer uh, Ray Rodriguez, great drummer. So we had a great drummer, great you know timbalero, great conguero. So the man, the rhythmic grooves are incredible. You know, it's very powerful. Yeah, and you know, I kind of had those feelings again recently when we were playing with uh, Skip Heller's group, and yes. we were. We were doing the when you did the uh, the the CD of your dad's songs, and we did a few concerts there in uh, now in Palm Springs, and locally in LA. You know, it's great to play that music. Always, we I did that again a couple of weeks ago with Danny when he did some of the Zoot Soup songs. You know, Chico mm -hmm. Chico Suaves, and we did uh, um, Vamos a Bailar and all that stuff. And oh. I got a chance to play out, and and I was playing mostly timbales and congas on that night as well. Those are great songs. Always come alive. Mm -hmm. and, Good for a percussionist. Yeah. We also played at that car show in San Diego. Remember that one? Oh, right. Low Rider Cars and all those low riders. Oh, right. Yeah. And Skip had some cool songs too in his set. Mm -hmm. I liked some of the songs that he picked. I was kind of hoping that was going to happen more. There were going to be more of those gigs, but you know how it goes. Right. It's hard to get it's hard to get to work for a big band sometimes. Yeah, that more people harder to get a gig. Um let's talk about the uh the band we did with my dad. So uh, the way that happened was uh, in 19, I believe it was 1998, uh, my dad got an opportunity to perform in Paris, France. He had never been to Europe, you know. And he asked me to be his musical director and, and come with him and play guitar. And the budget only allowed for uh, three musicians. So we got a bass player, Lorenzo Martinez, Lencho, who you know. And the three of us went to Paris and uh, to back my um, to back my dad. We rehearsed for a couple of weeks. We did about a twelve song set. Two of my songs on the Boulevard and Oh Maria. Ten of my dad's songs, including some of his funny parodies, 
his Pachuco stuff, you know, some of his classic Mexican Naranchera songs. We covered the, the whole gamut of his styles, you know. And uh, it was wonderful. We were flown to Paris to do uh, one show, one hour, you know, and treated very well. And uh, Flaco Jimenez was also there with his band. And so we had a bunch of uh, Chicanos on the loose in Paris. Wow. And we had a lot of fun playing and roaming around Paris and going to the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and uh, great restaurants. And it was a wonderful time. I have an article on my website called uh, Chicanos in Paris, you know, telling the story. Uh, MarkGuerrero.com, might as well plug my website. But um, that's when me playing with my dad again in a live situation started up again. And so when we got back, these other opportunities started coming up. So I decided to put together a whole band and of people of my generation, you know. That's why I called it the second generation band. Right. And... Um, so um, we started doing a bunch of gigs, and uh, here's a list of them. Uh, the Getty Center, we did two nights there. You played there, right? I did, I remember that. Uh, California State University at LA, LA Cal State. Right. An auditorium with uh, Nidia Rojas on the bill. Uh, we did two shows at Cerritos College, but you're not sure if you did both of them or one of them. I did one of those. One yeah. in 98, one in 99. The Pico Rivera Arena, which you had somebody with getting that gig. Talk about that. Yeah, I was at the time I was, you know, after I got my visual art degree, I always stayed, kept my hand in, you know, working. I had to always run working out of a studio. I uh, did some, you know, one man shows, some group shows. I curated a couple of shows. One probably the most the well-known I did a show called Chicana Beloved at South Help Graphics. So I was always always in my kept my hand in the visual art thing. So I became the director of their of the Pico Rivera Center for the Arts. So they had a gallery there and then I was doing all their programming and a lot of the documentation. I began started getting into video editing. So kind of taking me a little bit away from the music, but I I I did produce that big there was a show featuring um, the second generation band uh, with Lalo, of course, and uh, Nidia Rojas was on that show. And it was at the Pico Rivera Arena, which is a uh, basically a uh, it's like a, a Mexican rodeo a char a charro venue. And so we were out there playing in the dirt and it was super fun. I remember that that was a great day. I have I do have footage of that. And yeah, that's on um, YouTube. We were actually elevated on a stage. But the whole arena was just dust and it was dust was flying and, you know, right. you through dust to get to the stage. Yeah, it was one of those, you know, the thing about me and my career, a lot of it is it started. It was, you know, visual art was something that was always a part of what I was doing with, you know, teaching and, and doing my own work in the studio. And then I started kind of it became almost a 50 50 thing with the music. I, you know, kind of a it's good and bad it kind of took me away a little bit i didn't have my focus i don't regret it but it part of it was that that concert i remember you know being part of the production thing i also worked as a producer for a lot of shows i did numerous shows for the uh uh antonio Villaraigosa. i would stage manage and produce all of the so-called victory parties and you know the big concerts lala was in on a couple of those i'm sure and you know other people would come in and you know Pancho sanchez performed and so i would do the whole you know producing the show getting all the talent and following up on all that as another hat that i wore it was i don't know it's not something i liked it but that's something that i just didn't pursue for a minute there, I thought I'm going to be a producer. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Well, you're primarily an artist. Uh, yeah. As a musical just, artist and visual artist. Yeah, I guess maybe that's what I, you kind of, you have to find your, you have to find the the right hat that fits. Right. That's right. So uh, we also did Spotlight 29 Casino in Indio, but I'm not sure if you remember if you played that one. But the biggest one, one of the best ones was the uh, mural dedication concert. In Tucson, Arizona, my dad's hometown. Right. And, and they, there was a big mural of my dad. And uh, uh, and so we performed in front of it, right on the street. And my dad wore a zoot suit. 
Right. And, that was uh, fun. And, and people were dancing out in the street. And it was just a wonderful experience. That's on YouTube as well. If you do a uh, Lalo Guerrero Tucson mural dedication concert, 1999, you'll find it. There's some great footage of that. Yeah. And I had played with war. And for some reason, Tucson was a big town for war. So I played there at least, I don't know, four times in the, in like around 96. Oh, I should probably read the lineup of the band. Uh, okay. So Lalo Guerrero with Mark Guerrero and the second generation band. What a long title of the band name. So uh, aside from my dad, it was me on vocals, uh, guitar and musical director. Uh, Lorenzo Martinez on guitarron and background vocals. Lencho, who plays with Los Dados today. He was with the Rock Angels. He plays with the Tex Maniacs. Right. San Antonio now, a Grammy-winning uh, group. Um, the great uh, Steve Alanis on sax. Uh, fantastic sax player. Just used him on my new EP as well. And uh, if he if, uh, if he couldn't make it, uh, we sometimes used Al Lopez, great sax player. Uh, you were on congas. Uh, the late Bobby Dominguez on drums. I don't know if you know he passed away about a year ago. Yeah, yeah. and that was kind of the lineup of uh, that band. And when we did all these shows I mentioned, and uh, and the last one we did was near your hometown, in your hometown uh, of uh, City of Commerce. Uh, at the uh, Rosewood Park. We did an outdoor thing in the daytime and um, that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it was, fun. it was great to be playing back in the city of commerce, you know, yeah. the kind of full circle. One memory I have of that was uh, we were doing my dad's comedy parody, There's No Tortillas, There's No Tortillas, There's Only Bread. And he's singing that right. song, you know, to O Solo Mio. And uh, some lady, random lady, was sitting there on a blanket, and she happened to have some tortillas with her. So she picked them up and like used them like as castanets. She starts dancing with the tortillas while we were playing it, and then we were like cracking up. There was another time we played. Uh, I played with my dad at the John Henson Ford Amphitheater. I don't know if you were on that one, but um, I can't. I can't think of the female comedian's name, but she sang "There's No Tortillas," and we backed her up, and. Uh, she started throwing tortillas into the audience like frisbees. Right. Were you there? It sounds familiar, man. And there's just for sometimes things that were kind of cloudy because there's there were so many shows. And then some people were throwing tortillas back, you know. So that was kind that of really the first. <laughs> I have the, the set list here, the songs we would do to give you an example. Cancion Mexicana. That was the first song he ever wrote that was uh recorded by the great Lucha Reyes in the like 1939 or 40, something like that. And then later by Lola Beltran. And it's a standard in Mexico that every mariachi knows. Every mariachi on both sides of the border knows Cancion Mexicana. That's an amazing fact. Yeah. Right yeah, and Nunca Jamás. It's another song that my dad wrote that was recorded by Trio Los Panchos in Mexico, by Javier Solis, by Jose Feliciano. And uh, that's a standard on both sides of the border that every mariachi knows. So anywhere you go, if you say... To a mariachi, play Cancion Mexicano, Nunca Mas, they'll know it. So my dad's unique in that I think he's the only Chicano uh, songwriter that has written two songs that are standards in Mexico. You know, he crossed over the other way, you know. So it's pretty amazing. So we do those two songs. Then we do his funny song, Tacos for Two, which was a parody of Cocktails for Two. It was a romantic rendezvous to sit and chew those tacos for two made me laugh every time i heard him sing it so many times you know as we're talking about this i have an interesting lalo story that mm -hmm. you know there was a minute there where i was doing like i said i was doing a lot of video production and stuff and so i i i asked lalo if he if he would sit for an interview with me because he had already told me about his background with a like when he was a young player when he was he was traveling and he would tell me these outrageous stories like the story about the there was a, some guy who would come into the town like the night before and they would bury him, you know, in, in a big, oh, coffin, yeah. Oh, yeah. a big coffin and he would have enough air to like live through the night. <laughs> and then they would, they would dig him up the next day as part of the show. And just yeah. stories of that caliber, just totally over the top. And I said, Oh, we got to get this on tape, you know? So I, I sat, I, I brought in some friends. David was one of them, David Martinez, who we stayed at his house when we went up to San Juan. So it must've been after that. 
Anyway, I made the mistake of bringing a female photographer to to run the to do the video. And all of his juicy, spicy stories, he wouldn't tell him because there was a woman in the room. Uh, of course. And it was it was really weird because I was like, what happened to the great stories? And he clammed up because he just he was being respectful because he was kind of old school, you know. Yep. And I always regretted doing that because I, I missed the best part. I was that's what I was hoping for all these because it was this class. I still have that on tape. Um. I haven't seen it in a while because I was just really I was just deflated after we did it, you know, because I didn't want to I didn't want to say, hey, come on. What happened to the stories? What happened to all those good, juicy stories? Because it would have been Yeah, embarrassing. a lot of those just spicy, juicy stories. Believe me, I've heard them all. So getting back to the songs, then we would do uh, one of my songs, Oh Maria, which was a, like a polka, it's kind of a Tex-Mex polka in English. And then we would do Chicas Patas Boogie, you know, that was used later in the movie Zoot Suit. Uh, Muy Sabroso Blues by Jazz Muy Sabroso Blues, very hip blues Great song. in Spanish, yeah. Uh, his great Barrio Viejo, That's probably the last great song he wrote. And it might even be the greatest song he ever wrote. He wrote it when he was like in the 90s, when he was already late 70s or something. Right. And it's a, a song about his childhood in the Vario in Tucson. And it's uh, unbelievable. It was later re-recorded for the um, Ray Cooter Chavez Ravine album. He did a new version on that. Uh, my song on the Boulevard. And then my dad's parody, Elvis Pettis, the Mexican Elvis. Right. Elvis Pettis, the mariachi from the land of the Huarachi. Yeah. Uh, so we do that. And uh, and then sometimes we do Vamos a Bailar, one of his Pachuco songs that was used in the movie Zoot Suit later. Uh, La Mini Falda de Reinalda. Right. Great song. There's No Tortillas. Uh, my Immigration Song, comedy, kind of comedy, but not comedy. Ay, 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 nobody told me. My dad's No Chicanos on TV. I think that I will never see any Chicanos on TV. Uh, El Hombre Gordo, Marijuana Boogie. Uh, Orale, it's one of my Pachuco songs. My dad's uh, Chicano Pride song, El Chicano. Right. And the great rocker, Tin Marin, El Pingue. Oh, yeah. So that's, those are the songs we would do. We did, you know, all those shows over a three-year period. Had a great band and had some great fun. I'm glad I got to do that. The weird thing about it is my dad and I could have done this in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, but we waited till he was really old. But he was still capable of uh, putting on great shows. Right. I also did a show, and this is the day that I met Skip Heller. Was I think Skip was, uh, I don't know, the band leader or something, and Lalo came in. This was at the Japanese American Theater. Oh, yeah, yeah. I went to that, yeah. Yeah, I was I I stage managed that that event, and I a lot of groups played, right? Yeah, I sat in with somebody. I think I sat in with Piera. Yeah, I just remember I went up and sang. Uh, I think it was Chuko Suarez with my dad. My dad and I did a lot of shows in the later years, like I said. Uh, um, and so I'm glad I got a chance to do that. You know. I'm, yeah, me too. I I was I was super honored to be a part of that with Lalo and, and you and. Those are those are great shows. I loved all of Lalo's songs. They were just so clever and so just unique. Yep. And incredibly diverse, you know, all the genres he could do. Uh, let's see, what else? Did we miss anything? No, what just, you know, I I mean, recently I I've I kind of I started working as an arts educator um right after the uh right after the um one of the uprisings in in LA, they threw a lot of money at the at the at art programs and stuff. And I started working with Ruben Guevara with a program called Arts for City Youth. Um, and that kind of I kind of took a turn towards being an, an arts educator, uh, what they call a teaching artist. And that's really kind of where I'm at now. I still love playing. Uh, I get a chance to play every. You know, I could have put my own group together, but then I thought. I think I'd rather deal with second graders than musicians. It's about the same, isn't it? <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> uh, no, I'm partly joking, but part of it is, yeah. So I, I took a turn as an arts educator. I did a, I did a really cool music program. And we also, uh, this was called Rock the Classroom. 
I wanted to mention this because Rock the Classroom was a literacy through music program that I did for about six years. And this would be like in the late, uh, I guess, more early 2000s. And um, it, the idea was basically having using teaching kids literacy and figurative language in songwriting. And I would always use your dad as an example of that, how you would switch out the lyrics. And that was basically what we did. So we had, a, I mean, for a while there, I was, the kids were all writing songs about Lalo and his career. So I would kind of give them some facts. In fact, I wrote out a little bio. I would pass it out to the kids. They would read it. And then we would write verses about his career. I mean, we wrote a bunch of really good songs. I got to get those to you. Yeah. And then we would record the kids. So that was Rock the Classroom. I got into that. I like being an educator. I like, for me, it's really, it's really a rewarding. Uh, I was, my life was really turned around by um, influential teachers who were encouraging me to be artistic and creative. And so I try to do that now with kids. Pretty, it's fun. I, I really like it. It's very fulfilling. Well, but, you know, I'm still waiting for you to call me for gigs. Well, I'm still waiting to get the gigs. You know? Maybe I need a manager. You talk about you always had a manager. I'd be your manager. If I had if I had other things to do, I'd be your manager in a minute. We we we'd take it to the top. There you go. More about what you've been doing lately. The the art. Uh... Well, uh, the album covers and stuff. The CD covers is something that I I, I did about four of them. Uh, yes. I, I was using I was using for a minute there. I'm still kind of working on an extended series of um, of scratch board art of uh, inspired by by different Afro Cuban musicians. I did I did a a piece of uh, Chano Poso. I did one of Celia Celia Cruz. I did one of uh, the great Benny Morey, who in a lot of ways I made a lot of connections with him and your dad and how he would switch out styles and. And just being such a, a charismatic um, singer and band leader, and and then I had a chance to do. My brother did a CD called "Love Is the Reason," and I I did the cover for that. And then I've done a couple of others. Uh, I was going to do one for uh, the great um, Oscar Hernandez, but we couldn't come to an agreement on the image. So that was the watercolor that I sent you. And then it was I was really you know honor to be asked to do um to do your cover and that was suggested to you by um the great artist from arizona um zarco zarco yeah zarco is zarco. zarco guerrero oh my god he's it's you guys aren't related though right no but uh but in, like he says we are in the sense that you know they knew my dad his dad knew my dad his grandfather i mean it goes way back the family's uh being close yeah, he's super talented. I wish I could see him more often. He does great work. Oh, what and you know the mask making. Yeah, he does all the art, any kind of art, but those mask yeah. making. He studied in Japan with the masters. You know. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, right now I'm, I'm still, I still love to play when I get the chance to. Um, I most a lot of my focus right now is my visual art and my teaching. Uh, you know, we do what we need to do to make a living and what, you know, what is um, inspiring to do, how to spend your days as we're getting a little bit older. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, so um, growing up in East LA and uh, what was your impression? I mean, you're younger than me, a bit younger than me. I don't know if you were around to witness the big 1960s boom, you know, the Midnighters and the Blendells and the Premiers. We were a little young. I was in 65. I was, 10. But you know, it's interesting because in commerce, the city commerce, uh, the city commerce was, was incorporated in 1961. So what I wish that I had seen, had a chance to see more of is that in Bandini, so my neighborhood was Bandini, that was part of a, like a neighborhood in commerce, but there was a ton of garage bands. There was a ton of garage bands and there would be all these parties, you know, with the, in the literally in the garage. And I kind of only caught the periphery of a lot of that, but it did inspire me. Like, I, I wish that I had gone to the El Monte Legion Stadium. Right. Did you ever go there? No, I didn't go there myself. No. Yeah, so that was another one of those things where I kind of, you know, my my East L.A. experience was had a lot to do with my neighbor, Joe. You know, Joe Baragan. So I'd go over, and I was just a little kid. I'd go over, and I'd listen to him play. And a lot of it was... 
um, you know, like early Latin crossover music, the cha-cha-cha craze was going on at that time. And Joe, you know, he, he would always bring me in when I was just learning how to play, um, just taking lessons. He would take me to uh, some of his gigs that he would do. Um, he would do these like Latin, he, a friend of his was doing like Latin dance lessons at a, at a studio in Hollywood. And he would take me into, you know, to, I would sit in with them and, you know, I was just getting, learning how to play at that time, just basic, super basic stuff. But it was, a. Uh, I saw, always saw that as an extension of that whole East LA music scene that Joe was a big, a big part of. And a lot of, a lot of his uh, uh, contemporaries were a big part of. So what about the seventies? Now in the seventies, you were a teenager, you were probably into your mid teens. Did you witness what was going on with uh, Tierra and some of the seventies groups and El Chicano and any of that? Yes and no. I mean, part of it was I was at that time, I was really into folk music. Mm. You know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Gordon, Gordon Lightfoot, um, uh, even Judy Collins. Uh, you know, I a lot of my music uh, uh, influences at that time. I would go to the library in the city of Congress. They had a good library system, and I would check out all these albums. And it was, I was a real folky. My brother, I should say, my brother Patrick really turned me on to a lot of stuff. There was a, there was a, uh, uh, jazz station. I was at that time it was called K. Now it's KLON or, or K Jazz, but it went through a couple of different changes. And there was a there was a Latin uh, there was a Latin DJ, a guy named Richard Lejos, who played mostly salsa, but a lot of some crossover stuff. And that's where I first heard El Chicano. That's where I first heard um, um, Santana, all of that Latin rock stuff. Malo, Malo, right, and uh, a stick. Like yeah, like you were saying earlier, you your your sort of Chicano consciousness came a little later. Was that after college or something? Yeah, I kind of. I, and when I was, I started going. I graduated high school in seventy three, and you know, at that time, I was I was a deadhead for two summers. <laughs> so I was kind of following the Grateful Dead, and then I then I started. You know, I remember when I played Jose Feliciano's "Light My Fire" and uh, California Dreamin'. And it's kind of like when my deadhead friends like they just that's what we just separated. <laughs> it went one way, I went another way, you know. And that was that was the beginning of that. And um, you know, that's kind of why I chose congas is because I wanted to get into that and, and be a more a part of that. And Khalifas came shortly thereafter. And Khalifas came shortly thereafter. And we were, you know, our 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 set list was always, you know, we would do rancheras, we would do some oldies. We would do, you know, salsa, <laughs> you know, we would do a, a lot of that stuff. And we crossed over. Khalifas was a, was a great band for that because we, we and I think that's why we were so popular is because we mixed it up a lot. Most all of it was dance music and people got, you know, we, we were working like crazy, you know, back in those days. You should probably mention for those who don't know, Khalifas is a slang for California. It's a Chicano Khalifas. Right, right. And what were some of the other bands in sort of your genre and that were activists at that time? You mentioned Los, was that what did you say were in Los Perros as Los well? Los Perros, the Pueblo, that they were also, you know, very a uh, political group. And we kind of tied in with them. We did a bunch of shows with Los Lobos when they were still doing um when they were still doing their um, traditional you know, traditional music. We did a bunch of shows. We started to share the stage with them a bunch of times early on. And then and then when they met the Blasters and then they went towards a punk rocky sound, uh, you know, that that changed. And then they almost they seemed like they were making the point of not playing the traditional music anymore. I went to school with Dave Alvin at uh, Cal State Long Beach. We became friends in our ceramic class. In fact, I did one of my first gigs as a bongo player was with Dave Alvin on flute. Dave Alvin on flute. And he had a friend, uh, Mike Kennedy, who was a bass player. My brother played guitar. And we were playing, I remember the song we played at Afro Blue at a party at on Cal State Long Beach, which is a 6 8. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> you know, so part of it is that that was right when I was cutting my teeth on, on percussion and, and taking lessons and learning. You know, it was like a uh, test of fire back in those days. But those groups, you know, like I said, we we did a lot of we did a lot of concerts with Los Lobos. I re I remember those days. They were the funniest band on stage. I mean comedically? Comedically, they were just absurdist, but really funny. That's how we kind of came up, you know, back in those days. 
but there was always still that 50s oldies a lot of oldies you know uh even like Smokey robinson we we did a we covered all a lot of his songs um um was that barbara williams uh hello stranger all that stuff all that cool music we did we did a lot of that too a lot of that come out you know a lot of that that spirit came out of east la and and being from southern california you know was always kind of a so influential in in not only in what in our, our musical taste in general but also what we played in our set yeah speaking of dave alvin uh i'd never really um uh, seen him before i've heard of him of course the blasters and all that But when I played with Los Lobos as a guest a few months ago, three months ago, uh, at the Whiskey, a go-go on Sunset, uh, he was one of the guests, uh, Dave Alvin. He did a couple of songs. And, uh, How did he sound? he said, it sounded fine. You know, he, he has this whole, uh, this hat on and this beard. He looked like a cowboy from, you know, uh, Wild Bill Hickok or something. Right. But uh, Yeah, he was he's cool. a he's a road dog. He he's he just drives around in his car and does gigs all over the country. I I last time I saw him was at Cantor's many years ago. After In the deli? we, yeah, Really? Mm -hmm. he and we had been we had been close friends in college. And then when the blasters came out, he kind of, you know, I went to see them a couple of times. And, you know, rockabilly wasn't really my thing. I actually kind of got more into it later on. Um, I was more at that time when was more, I was really big into salsa, you know, and I went to see all the salsa shows and in LA, of you know, uh, Fania all stars and Roberto Rowena and, and um, um, you know, all those guys, my first, my first, When I was up, you know, when I was twenty one, my first concert that I could go to where they served alcohol was uh, Mongo Santa Maria at the at a at a jazz club in LA called um, the uh, what was it called the Lighthouse? Yeah, Wait, I remember that. Lighthouse. So you came a long way from Peter, Paul, and Mary to all this hardcore salsa. Oh yeah, I'm I'm very eclectic with my my taste. I, my dad was really into country music. And we would go on trips. We would go on like, you know, we would go down to camping trips down to Ensenada or whatever. And that was the, the days of the A track, you know, when you just stick Yeah, it maybe. in, you would just play over and over and over. So we had Hank Williams' greatest hits, Merle Haggard and the Strangers, Jose Feliciano, and uh, uh, Brazil 66, um, Sergio Mendes. and Sergio Mendes. And that was it. That was the four CDs we had. And we just, I mean, I have all of those songs are like totally imprinted in my head. I know every Hank Williams lyric, Patsy Cline, all that stuff. My dad was really into country music. Good stuff. So, um, I think it's about it, huh? Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for, uh, you know, taking the time. And, and I'm so glad that this is it, really an extension of our friendship. And that it's precious to me. It means a lot. Yeah, man, you have a great story, and it was one that needed to be told, so I'm happy that we got a chance to do it, man. So thanks again, man, and I hope to see you soon, and I hope we get to play again very soon. Yes. Thank you, Mark. We'll talk soon. Take care, man. Thank you.